Hello, I'm Dan Marshall from the METS Education Department, and many thanks to the hundreds of MET patrons and subscribers who are joining us here this afternoon. Today, the METS General Manager, Peter Gell, will speak with the extraordinary Norwegian soprano, Lisa Davidson, who on Saturday will deliver the latest performance in the METS acclaimed new Met Stars Live in Concert series. And many thanks to you, the METS patrons and subscribers who have turned out in force today. And now I'm gonna hand it over uh, to Peter Gelb and Lisa Davidson. So thank you both for being here and I'm going to vanish. Goodbye. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dan. And welcome, welcome Lisa and welcome all of our, our loyal MET uh, patrons and, and uh, followers. Uh, we're very glad to be able to uh, speak with you today. Um, I'm particularly thrilled to be with, with Lisa who uh, uh, provided one of the great highlights of our last season when she made her Met debut and probably the nicest thing uh, to happen to the Met uh, in a long time was, was her performances uh, as, as Lisa in, in Peak Dom, the Queen of Spades. And uh, we haven't had too many things to feel good about since then uh, in these difficult days. Um, and your debut, Lisa, was one that uh, is really um, extraordinary in so many ways. We, we were so excited and, and looking forward to your arrival with such great anticipation. And I know you were excited about it too, uh, but the, uh, you know, rarely, you know, in, in a world in which uh, things are hyped and, and uh, maybe sometimes uh, expectations are raised extraordinarily, uh, you truly delivered. Um, and even even the uh, most cynical of music critics, who normally I don't necessarily agree with, um, were, were unanimous in their praise and, and, uh, uh, ex uh, and in which they proclaimed you as the, the great new voice of your generation. So um, I'm delighted uh, that we are now going to this Saturday at a time when audiences cannot travel and artists can't travel too easily either, although you've managed to commute this week between Oslo and Berlin, which uh, we will we'll talk about. Uh, but this Saturday, you're gonna be performing a recital, uh, a, a, a program, part of our series of uh, pay-per-view concert events from your home country of Norway, from Oslo, from a very special place, the Oscar Paul Palace. And uh, so why don't we start off, maybe you could tell us a little bit about the program you're gonna be singing and that we're gonna be transmitting live throughout the world. Yeah, first I want to say thank you, Peter, um, for a wonderful introduction. Um, I think also the Met uh, debut for me was a, was a highlight, um, not, not only of last season, but, but in my life. Um, and I looked so much forward to going there, so much excitement uh, for the role, for the house, for the people. And I truly felt this warm welcome from 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 you from your staff from my colleagues from from everyone and and uh, also from the patrons that i uh, got to meet um in the weeks and and also on the day that uh, shows afterwards and and uh, yeah it's a good thing to hold on to these days when uh, and it's been weeks and months without work at all and hoping that we will be back and um then i just think it's wonderful that met the metropolitan opera has made the, this new series, The Met Stars Live, where we can actually communicate to our audience and through this, this it's not just a, a concert. I mean, it's a full production. And I can feel that now when we start, we started a rehearsal yesterday and then today as well. And it's so many things that need to be um, put in place and to be able to secure the sound and the light and the stage and where to be. And as you said, we will be in Oscar's Oscar Schall Palace, where also yesterday I met with Her Majesty the Queen of Norway. Who's a, who's, a big fan, who's a big fan of yours? Who's a big fan, and she's a big fan of the Metropolitan Opera as well. And uh, it's an honor to be there, and it's a beautiful room. It's, um, it's a very good representation for Norway, and um, not just the surrounding outside, but, but of course the surrounding inside has the, um, the painting from the 18th. 50s and um, yeah I just represent our, our culture. Um, in terms of program I have selected a combination of things that I have done many times, roles that um, like Elisabeth from Tannhäuser and uh, Ariadne from Ariadne of Naxos, roles that are very close to my heart that I've done the last years and also roles I will do in the future. 
Uh, and this is combined with songs that I love to do, also some Sibelius and some Greek songs. And uh, we will do the full Opus 27 by Richard Strauss. And then towards the end, as I've said uh, to my, my friends and colleagues, that that's the, the different side of me. And I think repertoire that people have not heard before. Uh, not, of course, they've heard the repertoire, but they haven't heard me sung the repertoire before. Um, and I look forward to that. I look forward to share something different from what people will see, what they normally see and what I normally do, just to, to show different sides and to, to fill in the program um, and, and make it more variated. Well, certainly uh, in the case of Ariadne, that's a preview of a role that you will be singing at the Met. Uh, yeah. And you'll be singing many other big, uh, big dramatic soprano roles at the Met. You're, right now you're, you're rehearsing uh, in Berlin for a new production directed by Stefan Herheim of uh, The Ring Cycle. And you're performing the role of Zieglinda, which is also a role we hope you'll be seeing at the Met in a future season. So what is that like? I mean, I, I know that, you know, the Met, of course, we're not able to perform right now. The uh, health situation in Europe is somewhat better than it is here in America. Uh, but the, uh, what are the conditions like in rehearsing for, for this new production? Well, in general, we are, of course, a bit further than, than, uh, than America, but it's still uh, distance in um, many countries in Europe, is the masks and and it's still quite restricted and uh, audience, I think they can have up until 400 if it's not more in the room and everything is quite difficult. This, the season at the Deutsche Oper Berlin has been cancelled uh, more or less the whole season. The Rheingold was cancelled, but they are now trying as much as they can to do Valkyrie as the only opera they will do full and, and normal. And then I think the rest of the operas they will try to do in concert versions or somehow find a way to do it. So the way they do the Valkyrie is to test us with the with the saliva test in the little box that we deliver every morning, picked up by our door or delivered the night before at the opera. And then we get the results back at um, 12 or, or 1 so that we can start rehearsals at two and then rehearse from two to nine. So it's um, it's somehow fill out the day because during the morning you have to make sure that you don't see or meet anyone so you don't get any COVID with you or on you. So, um, but everyone is very happy that we get to work and we're happy that we actually can sing. And then it was so surreal to come into the room and actually hug your colleagues and you could, everyone's like, yeah, I'm tested, I'm allowed. Um, so it's a very special and very grateful uh, room to be in, uh, and I think that's um, that's that's the general feeling I have from that production. It's hard and it's a lot of work, but but I love it and I'm I missed it so much. So um, so I can live like that um, <laughs> for myself and with myself for some months if it means that I can sing. <laughs> well, sorry, it's sort of like you know in, in America right now the National Basketball Association. Uh, has all of its teams performing in one venue in, a, in, in what's described as a kind of a COVID uh, 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 free bubble. So uh, yeah. it sounds like you're creating the same kind of... Uh, we are creating our own household, so to speak. <laughs> right. Of course, you know, economically, economically, things are very different in Germany than they are in America because the German government is able to subsidize the costs of of, of, of these um, op opera uh, productions and companies and in a way that the American Absolutely. government does. So we have a longer way to wait, but uh, you certainly are worth waiting for. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to your coming back at the Met. And as you mm -hmm. know, we have you booked in many seasons in the future. I thought just uh, for those uh, unfortunate souls who might be watching this, who didn't uh, attend one of your peak Dom performances, I wanted to play a little excerpt from your first act aria when you're waiting for your encounter with uh, Herman, uh, the protagonist, who uh, you don't realize quite how messed up he is at this point, but uh, later on uh, it comes, it is revealed. But uh, this is a, a, a little excerpt we're gonna play right now.
<laughs> so, is that difficult to hear yourself or is that okay? No, I think I've heard myself so many times for recordings and everything, but now normally I'm like, no, I don't want to. But now, yeah, I just miss it. It was such a nice time. You know, I was um, I made a point of being seated in the auditorium at the first piano stage rehearsal when you came on the stage for the very first time. I wanted to hear what you sounded like. And a number of my colleagues had the same idea. I think that I have <laughs> so many people sitting in the house uh, for for a simple piano stage rehearsal without without theatrical lights. The uh, what was it like for you? Uh, I mean, for me, it was incredible to hear your voice on that stage. Uh, you know, just seemingly effortlessly unleashing these absolutely beautiful uh, notes that filled the space for the Met, which is a much larger theater than than most opera houses. So I'm sure you must have had a lot of thoughts going when you were walking onto that stage. What, what, what was? How would you describe that? Oh yeah, there was a lot of thoughts going through my head. That's that's for sure. And I especially remember my first entrance because that that's with the uh, Grafinia, and I I, I enter up on, on on back back side of the stage, quite high up because of the raked um, stage. And just sort of seeing the room, and I remember that from from not just the first rehearsal, but of course also from the opening, because then the full room was it was filled with people, and and it was just something about the feeling in the room, but. I mean, people say that, yeah, Matt, it's it's so big and and uh, it's but it's it's wonderful to sing on, and and I agree, it is. You don't think that it's that big, and it's something about the communication. Of course, it is far from me to the one on the top on the back. Of course, in terms of communication and, and seeing and face uh, facial expressions, but in terms of singing, it was just. It was just really nice, and it, it, it's. I'm not sure if it was the staging or if it was the repertoire, but I felt it um, came together somehow. And um, yeah, it, it was just really nice. And then, of course, when the orchestra came in, you got this even more lifted uh, throughout the auditorium. I felt and uh, and um, yeah, it was a nice time. I, I also liked the production and the way it. it it communicates with with the with the rate station and everything. The uh, you know I I remember uh, when we interviewed Leontine Price a few years ago for this film about the Met called the Opera House and she described she still remembered uh, uh, she she was the singer who opened the new Met in 1966 and she said that when she got on the stage for the first time and heard her voice coming back to her. Um, you know, in that acoustic yeah. space, it was an incredible sensation that she's never felt before in any other opera house. Did, yeah, did you... and I think I think there is something about the house, the way you you will think, and it's not just because it's big, but it's this feeling of the Metropolitan Opera. It has this sort of this this history behind it, and and you want to feel it, and you want to be a part of it. But then on stage you are a part of it and, and you are a part of that room and, and you don't have to fill it per se. There is no need to push in that room. Uh, I think the only need is then the fear we have in ourselves, but in rehearsals you will you, you, you figure out that. <laughs> so I think it's, it's um, yeah, it, it, it travels in a, in a very nice way. And, and uh, yeah, you can somehow hear yourself and you can, or at least feel quite safe in the space, even though it's big and 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 you know there's a lot of people there. Yeah, you know, of course, your celebrated uh, countryman or countrywoman, Kirsten Flagstab, didn't sing on the stage of the modern Metropolitan Opera, but she, of course, she had one of the most uh, acclaimed debuts in her time in the '30s uh, when she made her debut at the Met in the old Opera House. Do you feel some extra kind of burden or, or responsibility or, or pressure of being compared to her, even though you're so young in your career? So, because so many people do compare you to her. Yeah, and I feel it's somehow become a thing to say, yeah, you you sound like Flagstar or, or you are the, the now sort of the new Flagstar in Norway. And I keep on saying that I love that uh, compliment. Uh, I, I put it in my heart and I said thank you very much but it's also 
just a compliment. <laughs> I am who I am and I want to do my things. And it's also quite in the past. Uh, and uh, and if I, if I can ever be compared, if I can ever reach what she did, I would be very grateful. But I, I believe we are in a different time and, and there is a different purpose for what I do. Um, and what I also want to do, I think, even though we we are in the same repertoire, and we will, my roles will of course overlap <laughs> what she has done. The big, the big Wagner and Strauss roles, and the I guess you know one difference today, of course, and and back then is in 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 Flagstad's time, opera was much more widely popular than it is today. Um, so in a way, you know, you are part of the vanguard of a new generation of singers who have the responsibility together with the opera houses who have to provide you with the means to, to achieve it, uh, um, to win over new audiences. I mean, do you see yourself in, in, in a, in a, as a, as a, as a ambassador for opera? Or do you, do you, uh, certainly in Norway, um, where you are a household name, um, you are, um, certainly winning new fans for opera. And I'm, I think you will in other parts of the world as well. Yeah, and I would say that's that's more important than to compare yourself with previous singers. It's absolutely more important for us today to keep on reaching out. And I have, I've said it a million times that I do believe in opera in the house. I believe we can do what we do for the audience that have been in the opera house and who now they they can't even wait to actually sit in the room, and I can. I can, I feel I can talk about this because it's the same as with my family and with me. We, I started quite late with opera. My family did not even go to the opera until I was on stage. And they have learned to love it through going into the opera. And I think that's my job to say that you are welcome and you should go and there is nothing to be afraid of. And you should give yourself the opportunity to find one act fun or the second or the third or that opera you like and that you hate you don't have to come in and love it all at the same time and that first moment you go in you have to say oh all of this is lovely that's not necessarily how it works it takes time but i hope and i trust that people are willing to give it that time to learn to love it because it's with everything that takes time we can compare it to a good wine or with food when it when it has some time, when it when you use and you spend time with it, that's when you learn to love it. And I think that's in a way the same with opera. You have to know a little bit about the story. You have to know a little bit about your music. And if you know the singer, you can appreciate that sound. If you know the orchestra or the conductor, and there's so many aspects that we present in what we do that our main audience, they love it for that. They love all that and they, they know all that. But for our new audience, we have to slow and steady say, well, listen to this aria now, listen to that. And I can tell now from, from, from this last month, my nephew, he's two and a half years old. And he is, of course, <laughs> he has not been to the opera yet, but we've been listening to music um, a lot. And I said, maybe you should, should listen to one of my songs. And we did, and then he, he knows, unfortunately, very well how to scroll on an iPad, so he can do all that already. And then he found the Queen of the Night with Dana Damrau. And he's been watching Queen of the Night, I'm not kidding you, a thousand times. <laughs> he loves it. <laughs> and we watch it over and over and over again. And people are like, yeah, can he listen to opera? And I'm like, yeah, it is about presenting music for what it's worth. He calls her the green lady and uh, and what, what does she have on her head? But he loves the music. And I that's a simple story, but I think it's in a way a way we have to to do this and present it step by step. And I, I hope that with some of what I do that I can bring my friends and their friends and then their friends and family again in, into the opera to being what I am and to, to pr present what I do in a way that it is worth coming for. You know, you were saying before that your parents uh, were introduced to opera. It sounds like you were saying through you, in a way. Yeah. Um, so you you grew up in a small Norwegian town of Skok Skoka. Is that? Okay. 
sorry for my bad pronunciation. Very, very close. Uh, <laughs> which only had, I think has 12,000 people living in it. And uh, in, in rural Norway, um, I, was, I was actually speaking to a, a reporter from Norwegian television yesterday who told me that, which I didn't know, that you had intended to be a handball player uh, as a youth. And uh, somewhere along the line, you went from handball to, uh, to opera. So maybe you could tell us how that, how that transition happened. <laughs> Yeah, it is it is weird. I mean, it's also quite surreal that it ended up in opera because it's so far away from what we listen to. I mean, my dad and my mom and, and my family, they, they love music, but they are not music listeners. So they didn't used to go to the concert house or to the opera and, and places. And But I started then playing the guitar and sing a little bit and I wanted to sing chorus and and just just sing it. I don't know what it was, but I think I found a place where I could communicate some things that I couldn't put into words. I think that through the singing, I could, yeah, describe how I felt as a as a teenager, early adult, going into this. And it was just also my world. It was what I did. And, and at that time, I didn't care if someone listened, but it was my way of finding my communication in a way and I think the more I did it the more I enjoyed doing it and then when I started in school we had to sing a little bit of classical music a little bit of musical and even though I wanted to either do musical or pop music we were introduced to the classical music as well and um, then I realized that I like that and then I had to figure out what is actually opera and how does this work um, and yeah so it was a learning process for me but I think it's um, it's of course sounds quite out of the blue, but I also believe that there is a reason why I started with singing, and there is a reason why they said I should listen to classical music, and I I learned it. I learned how to love it, and I also found my way into this this uh, profession, and um, as as well as many of our listeners find their way into to their favorite composers or even just into the opera house. Was there one uh, sp a specific event that made you realize that you should really study to become an opera singer? I think for me, it was Bach and, and the early uh, Baroque music. That was my way into the classical music. And then I saw my first opera when I was um, around 20, which is, I know, very late for many people. Um, but it's never too late because now I'm 33 and I am singing in the opera. So, I mean, there is... Um, um, always possibilities but I remember actually doing Ariadna of Naxos at the Opera Academy even though I already started at the Academy I somehow wasn't sure if I could do it I wasn't sure if I should do it or if I had something to to do but I remember when we did that and we also did some uh, some parts of Arabella and I remember that I don't know if it was the staging or if it was my colleagues or if it was just the music that I thought okay now I will do whatever it takes to be able to do this as my profession. I think also it took some time for me to realize that you could actually live as a singer. <laughs> but also it takes, it takes a lot of physical training too. I mean, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so maybe, maybe your athletic background helped you in that. Yeah, or I think maybe the sports way of thinking could uh, help me a lot in terms of um, of uh, working hard for to achieve what you want. And I think that's something I also learned from my mom and dad. It's not about if you if you can, you can if you want to, but you have to work for it. And if you if you start something, you should at least try it 100% before you give up. And um, we have been through many of those uh, where I maybe wanted to give up, but I think together we have we have um, found a way to to see why I do this and also um, how, why I like it so much. Well, I'm very glad. I'm very glad you didn't give up. The, uh, <laughs> and, so, and so are opera fans everywhere. The you know about five. It was about five years ago, I guess, that you accomplished this great feat. I um, just, I guess, hearing what you said before, seven or eight years after you had even discovered opera, uh, you uh, won two of the most important competitions in the same, I guess it was the same year, uh, the Operalia competition, and then the Queen Sonia competition in Norway. Uh, and 
which is how we first, uh, I say we, the Met, not me personally, but my, my colleagues who were, one of them was on the jury uh, in, in Norway and also on the Operalia jury and uh, came back with all these extraordinarily glowing reports about <laughs> your incredible talent. And so tell us a little bit about the excitement of being in competitions. I'm sure you must be happy they're far behind you at this point, but the, the, uh, what, was, what was it like to, to enter the, the competition in your own country and, and to win it? Yeah, to enter for uh, so that summer it was in July. I think the Operalia was in London in July, and then in late August was the Quinsania competition. So it was quite close to each other, and and of course Operalia was the biggest surprise because uh, since I won that first, and that really came as a huge surprise for me. I <laughs> I I couldn't really understand when I stood there. It was like he said that okay, okay. It's it's all a blur. Uh, for me, <laughs> because because it was so um, out of the blue. Um, I mean, I, I came from, from Copenhagen at one year where I did auditions. Um, I had some work coming in in some uh, some fine houses, but but this this change that it gave, and then a couple of months later, when the Queen Sonia was, then that's the competition I had been wanting to do for many years because that was the Norwegian competition. And it was at home and then suddenly the pressure was so high because of the Ferrari and everyone was expecting me to win. And I was like, but all I wanted was to, to attend this competition. Um, but it was, it was wonderful. It was intense. Uh, it was overwhelming to, to be a part of it and to also then see how it changed my, my life afterwards. And I think that's that's how competitions are. It's, it's somehow we we need it because we get to meet uh, people like you and and your staff. And of course, maybe there's a way to get an audition in all of these houses. But in competitions, you get maybe twenty jury members from twenty different houses, and they get to hear so many singers at the same time. And that's the opportunity and a and a way to to somehow hear and see. The new singers and and I, I believe that that was um yeah was my 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 breakthrough and my turning point and and and, and everything and and to have uh, the queen of norway uh, presiding over this competition and and becoming your your big fan yeah that was our first meeting and and i remember um when she came out and she read uh, she had the the prize in her um the the print that's inside um, and I'm given then the, the prize, which is this huge um, sort of prize and picture. And then the sports girl in me came because I lifted it like it was a <laughs> huge sort of diploma. And I remember I sort of lost it a little bit because I was so happy and maybe the opera singer should have sort of kept it to herself and been very professional. But I was so happy and so overwhelmed <laughs> at that time that uh, even if the queen was standing in front of me, I, I just needed to share with, with my audience how happy I was. And, and Queen Sonia then became uh, such a fan of yours that she actually flew to the Met for your debut. Yes, she did. And just to hear my debut. I mean, how amazing is that? And she, we met yesterday because we will talk a little bit in, in our concerts as well. And, and we, we talked a little bit about what we want to talk about and she she repeated that with with the with the with the debut and the time in time she had in new york and meeting you guys and meeting my my audience in a way and um i felt not just because she came just to see me but there was something about a meeting afterwards that yeah i felt we connected somehow and and I just love that she supports the art. I love that she supports the classical music and that she supports what we do because it's not something she has to do. It's something she wants to do. And I think that's very, very unique and um, yeah, very appreciated from, from my side, of course. Well, you say, it sounds like you've had sort of like a fairy tale um, uh, existence, you know, growing up growing up in the countryside of Norway, becoming Norway's great <laughs> opera star. And now, Racing with the, the, the world's greatest opera houses. You know, I mentioned before that uh, some of the roles, um, or that you will be coming to the Met to sing so many roles. And uh, for for the people listening in today, I know they'll be very excited to know you'll be singing the, the Marshallin also. 
uh, yeah. next year. Uh, you're scheduled to sing Fidelio. We'll see if that happens. Uh, but if it doesn't, we'll we'll figure out a way to do it another time. <laughs> um, and uh, um, what 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 roles? What are the roles that you that you hope to uh, make your own in the coming years? Well, I think as you mentioned, Marceline, Marceline, and the Rosen Cavalier was the first of I saw, and and at that time, I could never picture myself doing Marceline. But it's been an opera that I've really, really learned to to love or it's it's now I, I just love it and it's the role I really look forward to do and as well as Siglindas I'm doing now and um and I think also the Italian repertoire that I'm I'm going to take on for the next year is like Unballo in Mascara and Don Carlos. And there's so you're, many you're even, you're even singing Il Tabarro at the Met in a future season. And Il Tabarro, for instance. I mean there is so many great roles that are um there for my voice and 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 this um ladies that I get to somehow encounter and um yeah but of course the Strauss and the Verdi repertoire it's it's, it's close to my heart and then and, and I am um, I look forward to them I'm so glad that I get to do the Matamet as well and to do the the Rosenkavalier um, production that that Fleming did whom I always looked up to and, and and then I can somehow try to at least <laughs> be in her shoes for a while so I look forward to that well, it's great that you have that you're going to vary your repertoire between Italian and and German. I think it's probably yeah. very healthy for your voice too to be able to go back Absolutely. and forth and your development as an artist as well. So um, I said to you beforehand that we also have today some questions from our audience that have been submitted, uh, and I wanted to I would be remiss not to not to um, uh, read them to you. So I'm, I'm sure uh, people who submitted them who are on this call would love to hear your answers. So. Of the questions from our audience, the first one is, which operatic character most closely resembles the real you? That's a difficult one. I mean, they all have so many good qualities, but they are so... I mean, they're all extremes. I mean, either they kill themselves or they get hurt by their husband or partner. It's, it's a very, very <laughs> deep uh, <laughs> level. But I guess... I remember saying, and now when I did Fidelio just before lockdown, what I like about Leonora is her strength. And it's not necessarily what I have, but it's what I wish I had. Her strength to just sort of go through and, and fight for love, fight for life and fight for what we want to do. And if I don't, I'm not sure I have it, but it's at least something I want to have. Of course, there's also the character in your future, the role that every opera house manager in the world wants you to sing when you're ready <laughs> to sing it which is, of course, Brunhilde, yeah. which, would, which would be a, a great heroic role for you as well. We cross our fingers for her in the future, don't we? <laughs> <All right. laughs> I, I should add that I was asked that question too from the audience, what, what, what character I would like to be, and I would simply and? say, I would like to be one who survives. Uh, yeah. I think it's... Uh, do you have a favorite since, survivor? Since, since, so, since, so, since so few characters do survive, particularly tenor. <laughs> I guess but you're also the head of the Metropolitan Opera, so you can also be someone in power, like someone who tells people or choose something. I mean, there's so many characters that could suit you. I we'll have to go. I'll study up. The uh, all right. Here's another one for you. Um, who is your professional role model? Someone whose career inspires you? Yeah, I think I have. I have never had this one singer or one one um, artist that I look up to as this one and only. But I must say that Renée Fleming, I admire her a lot for her clever and very well put way of choosing her repertoire, and also her combination with doing opera and songs throughout her entire career. If I can manage that. I'll be very happy. And um, I think, yeah, just the way she has kept her voice fresh and, and yeah, I, I, um, I love the way she has, she has done and also does her career. I'm sure Renee would be very pleased to hear. <laughs> um, here's another, another question. Uh, Sinking the big Wagnerian roles is a feat of tremendous physical stamina. How do you prepare physically? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's an important one. I mean, I do work out um, at least three to five times a week, and I find it um, important uh, either in, in, in the gym. Of course, now in, in COVID, it's been a lot of running because that's a 
the <laughs> the best way to keep away, keep the distance and all of that. Right. But I also like to do some strength and 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 all training at my own. And I, I believe, and I've also said to young singers that the most important thing is to do something to to keep yourself connected with your whole body and also being able to do what the stage management and, and sort of the opera and the roles uh, demands from you. And it's given me a lot to, to, towards my, my, my breath technique and, and just to stay, stay on top. I, I find it important. Excellent answers to all. Listen, I don't want to keep you any longer because I know how seriously you take, you're taking this concert on Saturday and, um, I know you need to rest, you need to rehearse, you need to prepare. I know I'll be seeing you over the next couple of days on Zoom calls and uh, satellite hookups as we prepare for the program. I'm really, we're all really excited about it and for you. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for making the life of a general manager easier. Um, <laughs> because artists like you is what I dream about. And, uh, and I want to thank our audiences who so loyally have stayed with the Met even during these hard times and who we appreciate so right. much. I know you feel the same. Thank you so much. And I am so glad that you keep on supporting us. And I I love that we can communicate this to, to you. And and I can't wait if it's not a Fidelio. We all know I will be back at some point at the Metropolitan Opera and then we can hug again. And I really, I really look forward to it and to see you and to to be in the same room. Well, thank you. Thank you, audiences today, our donors. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, stay self safe and healthy, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan.